Thank you, everybody, joining. This is the second episode of the Road to Recovery podcast with your host, Tommy, and your co-host, Ryan. How are you doing, Ryan? Dude, I am fantastic. I'm flipping open the moon right now. We got our first <laughs> guest. Dude, if you don't even know who this guy is, highest profile no. guy we've ever had on the show, Mike. Mike, oh, sucks, come on down. Holy fuck. How does right. it, it feel, Mike, to be the highest profile guest we've ever had on the podcast? And that's not just saying you're the first guest we had, but yeah, how does that feel? It feels good, man. Uh, pretty humbling, happy that you and Tommy could share your audience and we can all blend and make a nice little smoothie, so to speak. So, oh yeah, we're a very, we're a very predominantly white smoothie, but yes, that's well, <laughs> it works. I mean, and as you can see, I'm just, I'm just the, the co-host. Ryan, Ryan is the actual intellectual and the, the comedian. Oh, of the, oh, no, I'm not the intellectual. I'm the one that keeps it light. You have the certifications. <laughs> So anyway, what we're going to obviously be talking about today is obviously Mike. Mike's actually suffered with an eating disorder as well, just the same as me and Ryan had. So just uh, what, if you want to introduce yourself, Mike, and obviously talk about your story, anything that obviously you don't want to talk about, that's yeah. fine. Say. Yeah, man, for sure. Um, well, you know, it's funny because you don't, a lot of times I feel like you don't really know that you have it because it just, you're just so used to being in a routine or, or a way of eating or thinking about food and, and yourself and your body. Um, so, I mean, I was a pretty normal man. I had a fruitful childhood, you could call it. Uh, it, was, it was really good. And, you know, normal eating habits, normal, like, self-image, all that jazz. And uh, maybe, like, nine, like, high school, uh, I went to a private Catholic high school institution. Really small. Everyone had their own bubbles and I would say that's where I start, like, thoughts and ideas started trickling to my mind, like, how could I do something to, to change myself, right? Because, um, mm. you know, I've never had a girlfriend, had, you know, my bubble of friends and all that, but, um, right. yeah, I, you called me a clout chaser or whatever. At that, But, yeah, I wanted a bit more recognition in some kind of way in high school. So I definitely, I definitely did some pretty radical mm. things with food. Um, not even my training was fine. It was just like my food habits, man. Cause like I would just be in this cycle of being in a calorie deficit for like six days and unintentionally, but like without control, I would like overeat, like whatever it was, seventh, 10th day. And you know, it's, and every week I was like, I'm going to stick to the calorie deficit for a longer mm -hmm. time, like every week. And because of that, I was training like physically all throughout the year. So obviously if I ate more, um, I would have actually gained weight and muscle, but I kind of really didn't. And if I did, it would have been a lot, lot slower relative if I fucking ate more, you know. Can I curse? Is that, 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 that Absolutely cuss away. <laughs> we, we right. do it's really funny you mention that because it, our story is like exactly the same. Like mine and your Mike, your your mindset and where you're at and what you're trying to achieve was my exact anorexia story. The exact same thing. Trying yeah. to build muscle, wasn't yeah. intentionally trying to lose weight, went in a huge deficit, and then next thing you know, you're 88 pounds and you look like shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I I was probably like, well, I'm five ten now, and I didn't really grow after. I was like five eight in freshman year. I was probably like. 140 pounds like lean lean cuisine right but i mean i couldn't i couldn't get my dick up if i wanted to and if i did in the actual fellatio time it it would be hard to keep it and i think that's a very genetic thing you know you like people like keno body if you've heard of him like mm -hmm. he's, he's really low body fats but i feel like if he was 13 percent, he would have a hypothetically better heart on you know i'm not <laughs> I'm not a doctor or anything, but that's my so, Obviously, you're talking about exercise. Do you think there was anything that kind of triggered you to obviously get in that road? Because obviously, we know that there's a lot of kind of genetic predisposition, and obviously, something in your life triggers it. Was there anything that you can touch upon that obviously started you off going down that road? Well, I would, yeah, I would say it was more social than anything, just like my peers around me and, right. and wanting to you know, be of some kind of stature because 
I mean, the sad reality is if you look X or Y way, I mean, people will look at you differently, listen to you differently, but I mean. Yeah, it's unfortunately, that's the truth. Yeah, but I mean, I feel like a lot of people grow out of that anyways, but I mean, you don't know that at the time because you're like 14 trying to have like veins up your abs. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, man, it wasn't, I, I like, I'm stuttering like a fucking chief. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know if there was anything within me that said to change that. I would, I would say it was more like my peer review around me and their opinions and all that. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say that. So, what was their kind of reaction? Did you get any kind of reaction off them? Because obviously, we know that there's a lot of talk about obviously. The biggest part of males with eating disorders, they always say that it's, there's a lot of, obviously, gay people suffer with eating disorders. And the reason for that is, I would say, is because people in the LGBT community, obviously, they're more open to obviously speak about their things. So yeah. it's harder for us guys that are obviously straight to actually speak out about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you get any kind of stigma, anything, or anybody react differently to you when you actually... And I mean, you know, I'm not gay, but I would say if you... Because I feel like every gay person eventually or has to come out to their family, or more than likely. Um, and I mean, I feel, I feel like that takes quite a bit of cojones to just talk about this is how I am. So, yeah, I feel like that would translate into sharing a tale or two about, you know, your eating disorder shit. So, you get into see Ryan, would you use your kind of. Say again? Ryan, I was going to say, is, is Ryan getting anything you want to say on that? Well, yeah, I was, well, it's interesting hearing your story and just like connecting and seeing how similar I think a lot of guys' stories are in in a sense. I feel like uh, because we don't often, and, and, and like statistically, we're a growing uh, demographic of eating disorders. I believe that's correct. Isn't that, Tommy? As far as like the statistics are about even. They're pretty dang close. And um, it's it's really fascinating to hear uh, a male's perspective talking about it, especially when uh, it's someone that's kind of doing a similar thing that what I was doing, mm -hmm. um, especially with with the, the working out stuff. And and I was doing the exact same thing you were. I was cutting, mm -hmm. um, except I cut for a very long time. And then about a year ago, I started doing a thing where I would binge on the weekend one day, mm -hmm. like tons <laughs> no. of like, IHOP tons of crap i have like tons of photos on instagram of this mm -hmm. stuff it was amazing yeah. uh and then i'd cut to like 1200 calories a day and work out like a mad horse to like get back down to my maintenance weight and that's how i was maintaining weight for like six to eight months yeah that um, sticks in my mind because i was again ironically 1200 like calories like literally and i would track that to the gram yep yep to the gram and that's another thing is like, so I have OCD and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people that have um, eating disorders have an OCD component because if you're tracking mm -hmm. it to like the nth degree, like you mm -hmm. were, you're definitely, ha so I, I would like to ask you, what was like the moment um, during all this? How long was this period of like being really like, I guess, what was your lowest weight? And if, you, if you're fine with saying that, yeah, and yeah. Also, like what? Yeah. When, I, how long was it before you started kind of like thinking, oh, maybe this is not the right thing to do? Yeah. So my lowest weight, I was probably more like 140 even, like probably 138 to 140 and like 8% eight, 8 body fat. And I never, I never took pictures and, you know, you look lean and, and all that, right? But I wanted to get bigger. So no, I, me too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I thought I looked recluse like a like a um like a Nazi concentration camp member and you know I was ashamed of that. But um yeah, I would say it was like a cut and binge eating like weekday to weekend cycle for easily two and a half years straight. I'm talking like if if a holiday came up, I'd go on vacation. Like I live in Florida right now and we used to vacation here a lot during the summers and like I remember, like those prior weeks too would be like when I didn't binge, and yeah. it, it would just be a mess. So, um, um, I have a question. Uh, yeah. When it comes to your your mindset when you were getting out of this phase, mm -hmm. what did you find the most difficult part in overcoming 
uh, that cycle that you had been in for two and a half years. Because once you get in a cycle, humans are pretty uh, habitual. I would like not everyone, but a lot of people, frankly, are schedule oriented and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So like once you get into a cycle, it's really hard to break a cycle. Yeah, it takes you so many days to create a habit. What what was your most difficult part in breaking that habit? I would say definitely you, if you want to gain muscle, I feel like you're going to have to accept fat gain. And yeah. that was, that was, totally. you know, you can minimize it all you want, but it, it will happen. And you, you have to accept that you're going to look different or something may not. And fat distribution is purely genetic. You know, my brother, mm -hmm. he has these arms that are like Google maps. <laughs> you know? My bag is like a roadmap, but my arms, you know, body fat goes there. Additionally, if I get to a certain body fat, it tends to go to my face quite a bit. And that is something I was extremely insecure about because like during, the, you got to understand during that cut time, when you're on 1200 calories, I mean, shit can change quickly. Not ideal, but it, it'll be quick. And, and you know, it, like the night and day that my face can go being like 8%. No, you're you're totally right, and I I've actually this is something that I'll be honest with I've been struggling with recently. So I'm currently still in recovery. I got up to I'm five foot eight. I got up to about one twenty, and then I got stuck there for like yeah. a couple of years, mm -hmm. and I'm like one twenty seven now. And yeah. I've noticed since my one twenty to my one twenty seven, my face has gotten fatter, and it drives me freaking nuts. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. I, in exactly. the mirror, I see myself uh, filming an audition tape and I look at him like, who's that fat fuck? <laughs> like, that's what I think. And oh, it, oh, it drives me nuts. But it's it's I keep eating. Yeah. So that's the, the only way I can win is by continuing to do what I'm doing. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and so unfortunately, like you still have these. I find that there's always going to be this part of you in your in your blood because yeah. it's in your brain. Like you, you yeah. genetically have these dispositions to the thinking this way it was probably yeah. meant to be um do you like do, how do you manage now I having mean, those thoughts still i mean just comparing like if, like if i said this hey you fat fuck what <laughs> does that make you <laughs> that yeah. make? <laughs> well i'm well, sorry no man i listen i've seen a lot of fat fox in my day <laughs> <You're right. laughs> i can I can different, differentiate the difference, you know, between one fat fuck to another relative fat fuck. I don't think I'm too fat right now, but no, no, uh, no one's, I mean, okay. I'd be like, eh, kind of, sort of, eh, so, so, you know, so I mean, I, actually, I yeah, can, uh, continue, continue, but you know, not to entertain it, obviously, if it's just someone like you said, that just said that, you know, probably say a sentence of some amount of wit and, and stroll on off, you know? <laughs> You've but always, got, you've sorry, always got to realize about that, that. That says more about the person that's saying it than the person that's actually, because you know, in the, everybody's interpretation is different. Yeah, well, I, I suppose what I was meaning is like when you look at yourself in the mirror and you feel those feelings of like, oh man, I'm getting. I'm like you. How do you manage that? Yeah, I'm a lot like you in the fact, in the sense that um, I look at, I don't accept myself, even if like everything was as objectively lean as possible. I'm kind of like you. I'm like, oh, shit, here we go, you know. But I'm accepting it because I'm aware that I won't progress in what I want. Um, and what I want is to gain strength, gain muscle, and, you know, just feel better, be more athletic, yeah, uh, better sex. It, you, you know. It just Better sex. Yeah, I'm down for yeah. that. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm working with Jason Blaha right now. I, I have a feeling you guys are doing that. And <laughs> I need to hit him up. I need to hit him up. I'm the I'm the lack. I'm the, yeah. I'm the laggy in this one. So obviously, obviously talking about that, what are you kind of doing with Jason Blaha? Obviously to move you forward and yeah, you get any set kind of diet you follow? Because I think I think when people hear what you're actually doing for your diet, they'll be quite shocked actually. But it's yeah. working really well for you. Yeah, most definitely. So I started with Jason in probably July, and there was never a set like food or a particular thing that we would try and eat every day. I mean, the biggest thing for me was, and my appetite is piss poor because in, in college I smoked a whole lot of weed. And on top of that, I, um, 
I do nicotine, right? I do the drool. And, you know, you weed gets expensive and you got to take your breaks from it. You just, you just have to or you won't function. And it's ironic because weed will certainly stimul stimulate your appetite. When it's not there, your appetite is nowhere. So it's, it's basically a double-edged sword. Additionally, I was smoking plenty of nicotine, which is, you know, an appetite like depressant basically so mm -hmm. all of that and and i you basically the goal was like three thousand to thirty five hundred calories in the beginning right and anything man like there was a cafeteria literally a block or a half a block from um where i dormed at and i would get everything i would get like roast beef sandwiches pretty much every day i would get little things of milk um honey buns oh my gosh honey buns don't even get me started on honey buns Jesus. like chips doritos everything but i mean in the back of my mind i was kind of keeping an eye on my fat grams and like when you're a caloric surplus and your fat grams are that much exceeded you will gain more fat you will it'll be stored a lot more easier than carbs would um but primarily just three thousand to three five hundred calories of whole foods and some amount of shit but the advantage with eating some amount of shit is it's often really calorically dense. So it's easy to, it's easy to eat a good amount of it. Like bread, mm -hmm. for example, it's not necessarily shit, but I mean, I could eat like 1500 calories of bread decently easily now, like without thinking about it. Um, well, your PDE must be quite high because you're often quite active. So you're probably, you're, you're busy. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I, cause it, it's, it's like daily dose dependent. If I'm, if I know I'm going to be active, if I know, because I live like right off of a beach, so I know if I take a billion strolls and get food or whatever, I know like, hey, I got to eat more calories today. I got to supply yeah. the shit I burned off. But um, yeah, it never really dropped below three thousand calories. Um, some days, like I would get McDonald's. I got my dad on this like McDonald's fix because we would always drive there, but. Um, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned earlier, you mentioned diet and weird diets. Now, uh, do you, and we wanted to dispel myths and stuff. Uh, so I have a lot of, I, I, I've been reading a lot. So my story is, um, si it's very similar to yours. Uh, it's only different in that I feel like I went so far with mine, I actually have injured myself. Um, like uh, yeah so like i have i have like nerve damage yeah. um but um i want to so yeah so i i wanted i guess for for people for people out there there especially guys that are going through a similar state of mind like you were and i was and even even you tommy like what would you say is 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 like a a trigger sign that that someone that may be watching this really needs to watch out for yeah um, when they're going down that road and they're like oh i'm in this cut mode because my thing was i got into the cut i got so addicted to the cut mm -hmm. that and i never started looking the way i wanted to mm -hmm. that i was like and then i got afraid to eat again because i was like i'm just gonna put on fat because i've killed my metabolism eating in a cut yeah so that was my that was my fear. So how, how, what, how, what would you just say to someone mm -hmm. that's like maybe doing the same things that you were doing and I was doing and how what I would you say to get out of that? Yeah. So uh, Jason made a video a uh, million moons back cause he does the, uh, the Q and A's weekly about fitness and all that avid watcher that I used to like watch all that shit, but um, he made a video cause I guess I asked a, a Facebook question that perturbed him about teenagers and like, the video was titled non-obese teenagers and losing weight, you know, and in the question, I remember like asking him, Hey man, like if I have 1200 calories here and I happen to be extra low on another day, could I like cycle my calories or like, mm -hmm. I would say the point where you start to be really aware of just how much you're trying to like get your calories exact and how mm -hmm. and, and if you go yeah, really low it's a fixation basically and and like such a large deficit to where you just it, it's just unhealthy a kind of deficit like like if you're doing a 40 percent calorie deficit daily that's a good place to say what the fuck am i doing mm. um yeah man just 
just being aware of, of how little you may or may not be eating and just just being aware of every number and just every facet about yourself like in relation to food i think i think what's really key to to getting over any hump in any sort of eating disorder situation is like you really have to be self-aware like you gotta you gotta realize what you're doing and it's really i think a lot of us can be self-aware and still do it because we always will either put it off till tomorrow mm -hmm. or will or we'll just or we just get in the, there's a human mindset of oh nothing will happen to uh, to me it's always somebody else's story that's fucked yeah. up yeah yeah um and and it's just like i like, i never thought i remember being in high school and in my health class and i was really into fitness mm -hmm. anyways I've, i'm just fascinated by it and um i remember watching a movie about karen carpenter who was a singer in like the 70s i think and she had anorexia and she basically ended up dying so we had to watch a movie yeah. about that and yeah. um i was just like man what a sad person like i'm glad i'll never be like that and then like literally a year later i started like doing the same yeah. thing it's crazy yeah i would say so it, it's it's crazy because it goes really far back with me just like subtle like knickknacks about myself or my face like i remember all the way back to like second grade dude was like why are your eyes so far apart mm -hmm. i don't know why the fuck i came out like that brother you know but so it's been you think it's probably been an insecurity thing that's really uh, good to i think i think a lot of a lot of uh i think almost everyone that has an eating disorder whether you're a guy girl gay straight whatever i think mm -hmm. it's all leads back to some level of insecurity 100 oh, yeah, that, that's the thing you see when i actually when you're talking about that I obviously know that as a big component of eating disorder starting, but before I had my eating disorder, I was the most confident person you ever can meet because mm. I, was, I was a professional footballer. I knew that I was the best because to be the best, I had to believe that. Yeah, I, was, yeah. I was the most arrogant, cocky person you've ever met before that, but obviously suffered obsessive compulsive disorder, which Ryan talked about earlier there. Mm -hmm. Basically what was happening with me was I was going to the, the toilet like, 12 times a day, obviously washing my hands. Oh, and then I would, get, I would get a bath up to like 12 times a day, constantly changing my clothes. And I, then, I then when my mom died, the disorder started. So the OCD was basically a trigger for me, for me to obviously have that component of the eating disorder. Yeah. And then something, something in my life triggers eating disorder, full-blown mm -hmm. eating disorder. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was pretty perfectionist with it. I don't have OCD. Um, but what I do have is PTSD. Um, okay. yeah. I was diagnosed with that uh, at the end of my junior year, and it it all stems back to just little like TikTok tidbit shit, like like what I had just mentioned, and mm -hmm. and it follows you like random weird subconscious memories of the past, whether good or bad, mm -hmm. like bad ones for me, because everyone gets those memories where they just pop the hell in. Yeah. Um, yeah, the bad ones kind of stick more with me, I would say, than others. And like, if I'm hanging, like I'm talking to this girl right now, like if we go out or whatever, I see a group of people, and like particularly people like my and, and Ryan's age, you know, Tommy, you're mm -hmm. a little past the realm. You just, you just went over running. the hump. Yeah. <laughs> I, how old are you now, Tommy? You just had your birth. Forty. Well, we're well, not even mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> 40 something man uh, oh, yeah. I'm not 40 something <laughs> but uh I I would just be more aware of it if if I'm like seeing a bunch of people laugh like for example in school I hear people laughing always assuming it's about me you know rather right. whatever it is they're talking about which is the reality of the situation um and I mean if no one ever had talked bad about like my face or my body or whatever because uh, i mean it was both um yeah i probably would not nearly be as insecure and this probably wouldn't have domino affected but at the same time i might not be here talking to you guys so see that's there's always a fine line and this is something that i um have been thinking about a lot with with a lot of things that are going on with me and uh and like uh my neuropathy most recently 
and stuff like that, which actually, in a sense, I have to be thankful that I got it because it was the one thing that kickstarted me wanting to actually start gaining weight again. Because before that, it was just like, I wanted to gain weight, but I was in such a fear mode of getting, like gaining fat that I would just like even eating 3,200 something calories that my trainer had me on. Yeah. I would like, I would like still burn it off because I'd figure it out. <laughs> I'd figure out how to burn it off in a day. And it wasn't too difficult. And I did that for many months. Mm -hmm. but there's always a fine line and kind of a blessing in it because it, it gives you like the ability to now share, share your story and yeah. maybe have an impact on somebody else. And if it didn't, well, oh, well, at least it's therapeutic for yourself. Brian, if someone can relate in some kind of way to me on here, I mean, if like one person did, like I would be so happy. I mean, I, I would like, cause, cause that's almost, that's fulfilling for me to, if to be mm -hmm. possible. To be able to do I, really, I really think you should obviously start a YouTube channel and things like that. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think you've got a lot to share and you can obviously, a lot of people I do think can relate to you. And yeah. you're, you are a success story, like I say, whether you believe that or no, you really, really are. And more guys obviously need to speak about it. That's really, really important because. I mean, if, I, I, if I could gain some kind of following and, and talk to people on the daily basis, baby, please, that Louis Marco line, that would, that would be really awesome. Um, you know, I am in school right now and, and anatomy is fucking hard. And <laughs> I am studying like at least three hours every day, but yeah i i really need to i i feel like i do because i would want to you know show my own eating uh vlog my shit you know just work out clips for certain um you know but see that's yeah. exactly how i felt like earlier this year because i've been doing me and you tommy have been doing youtube for like what three four years four like years. since we met like since we met like it's been like three four years um and and you've always kind of had a, a real purpose to your stuff, and I've really liked that about your channel, Tommy. And I always, I always, I've always been searching for like some reason to give back to something, but I could never figure out what it was. Mm -hmm. And like it was kind of dumb because it was like right in front of me the whole time. But like this is kind of this is kind of it. So there is like a real validating feeling. Like it's good for you, but it's good for other people because you don't want people to fall into the same traps you did. No. And, and I think that's the really, the really helpful part. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what my, my channel is all about. It's not about me. It's not about making money. I, like, I say, if, it, if a few people watch, brilliant. If a few thousand people watch, even better. But yeah. as long as it touches one person, and that one person doesn't mm -hmm. get doing the board that me and Ryan's been doing, yeah. that's that's good enough for me. That's what I'm all about. Yeah, yeah. I saw this one YouTube video where this little kid was like, "All right, guys, this is so and so," and and we hit the one like mark. We did it. <laughs> yeah, guys. I forget his freaking channel's name, but and then he blew up after that, and he got like a hell of a lot of subscribers. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. There yeah. was somebody similar that did like a, a zero subscriber special, and then that video has like millions <laughs> of views now or something. It's crazy. Jesus Christ. <laughs> YouTube's a crazy place, man. The internet yeah. is madly crazy. Yeah, so, so, so you're, you're, you're training now you're moving forward. That is, that is yeah. awesome. I am jealous of both of you, you suckers, like working out at the gym, like pushing weight. I'm like here doing my body weight exercise, like hitting the sauna, taking it easy, which is hard. So did hmm. you find, um, I guess, I guess the hardest part for me is, is taking the step back and, and reflecting and really focusing on recovery. Cause like I'm trying right now, I used to go to the gym seven days a week, mm -hmm. no rest days, yeah. hour and a half to two hours. Yeah. Um, and then I would walk like, tw yeah, don't, don't even get me, Tommy. Okay. I get it. Um, but uh, I used to go, I was, I was, and I would, everything was, um, it was almost like continuous hit training for an hour and a half every day. Hmm. I like, did not stop. I would track my heart rate. I was keeping it high on everything my i was doing a what was it a push pull leg split six times a week and then on the other day i did like a forearm thing and a bunch of crap yeah but um so i was i was definitely overdoing it so like what have you found in in finding like that workout balance and yeah. nutrition balance like talk a little bit about your process with that because i think that's something that anybody that's like us that's really workout oriented is yeah. really hard for us to find like yeah. today I went to the gym and just did sauna. Hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Like uh -huh. I wanted to like 
at minimum, I wanted to like get on the bike and just like do intervals. Yeah. Like, like, but I just didn't. So what yeah. is what is your process with that? Well, I mean, when when I started working, I was probably like right around ninth grade, and I was I'm like a big movie buff. I love a lot of the classic movies and all that. And back in the day, I would say Rocky took the cake like me. Oh, absolutely. About five ten, you know. Yo, Adrian. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you know, you just saw him busting his ass right in the training clips and scenes, and you think, well, hey, that's what I have to do. And and you just you add so many sets, and it takes hours and hours of your day each day for six days a week. Mm -hmm. um, it it gets tedious. But another part of it is you want to be done faster, so that's why you think you need to go so crazy those many days. Um, and I saw this one video by Jason that kind of clicked with me where it was like, you could literally, well, in the clip he was saying how you could literally grow off of one set like every seven days. And and you don't need all of this this extra, like not like non applicable like types of exercises that you can't like progressively overload on. And so just certain compound movements and, you know, having certain rep and set scheme and, and just gradually week by week trying to add here or there to the tonnage. Um, so me, I'm, I go to the gym four times a week right now. Uh, he, it used to be a three day full body. That's what I do right now. Yeah. yeah. But, um, as I progress the training, he's like, all right, I'm putting you on four day concurrent. So basically it's two upper and it's two lower. And I back and forth, I change the rep schemes for certain exercises. Um, and, and just keep track of it. But the point is I, I'm only in there like weekly accumulative three hours, like not a lot of time. Um, I'm roughly the same because what I'm doing is basically off floor work. Jason is basically taking me back to the, the very, very beginning level because I've got a lot of connective tissue damage, obviously, because of mountain disorder, which can happen quite a lot. Yeah. So I'm doing things like obviously glute ham raises, floor presses. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm doing a lot of, I'm doing a lot of similar stuff. Yeah. yeah. I used to be scared. Like, so I have pretty good lower tit genetics, you could say, right? So I was scared of bench pressing because I'm like, oh, shit, it'll grow my lower tit way too much. I look like I have saggy man tits. But I only would do the press. Um, and my bench press, um, when I started with Jason, it was 150 for three pause reps. And now it is 215 for three pause reps in about six months or seven months, something like that. And, and you know, they don't look too saggy, but it's, you know, that's just going back to insecurities. Like it would, it would only look if, if we could just genetically modify ourselves when we were born, like have our parents know what we wanted them to do. It's not going to be great. But it's like, yeah, we can't. That's something I, I think one of the things that uh, any any former eating disorder, anybody going through any type of like OCD type of thing is they have to let go of this idea that they have control. But like the minute, the minute, I, and I thought I had control up until about six months ago, and then my body fell apart. And then the moment my body fell apart, I was like, I don't have control over shit. Like it, it, like your body can only take so much abuse until it starts to break apart. And so that's, that's, kind, of the point. that's yeah. kind of the point I was going to touch upon. That's how a lot of people obviously don't actually commit to recovery because they feel that they're in control because they've got eating disorder. And yeah. they feel obviously committing to recovery that they're losing that control. But, but it's exactly the opposite. You're actually gaining control. But I feel like it would be pride too. Like, oh, I don't need help. I, I got it in the bag. But mm -hmm. now the bag has been literally fucked for the last yeah. year. The minute you can, so what did you, did you ever, so when did you ask for help? Like, did you see, did you seek? Yeah. 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 So I, um, so after my junior year in New York, I moved to Florida and went to high school here. And for that year I was seeing a, uh, I was seeing a therapist and, you know, just kind of talking about just my PTSD because like walk into a room, there's just tension for no reason, like in my body, like who's looking, how many people in the room, who's laughing, why, you know, and just needing closure for whatever to right. do. And, you know, we just kind of talk. And I like it because when you just talk about yourself for like an hour, like 
every week cumulatively, you'll, you'll hear yourself think a little bit. And I feel like you can better connect with your own thoughts. And, you know, the, my, my uh, therapist, Dr. Allen, she was really smart and had some nice ideas revolving around people. And, you know, I just tried to apply it and gradually it declined. It's still, it's still there. Don't get me wrong. But it, if you go, if we rewind the clock two years, I, big difference, I would say. Um, for sure. But after that, see, I was seeing a girl at the time, right. Over like LDR long distance relationship. Right. And it, it kind of cut off like in the summer and it was kind of, it was kind of ugly. Then met another girl. I broke up with her cause I thought she was cheating and she texted me, Hey, it's okay. I was cheating on you anyways. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Man. And when shit like just, petty shit like that happens you just you take it harshly sometimes and mm. you think it's because of me it's you know it's it's my shit but it's it's not you it's them as as the saying goes right so uh just just knowing yourself and your worth and just moving forward in some kind of way that's the point you've got to kind of watch because obviously stresses are the thing that obviously send you back so uh, it's mm. being in control of that and understanding the things that could obviously trigger you. Yeah. You back. I mean, at the same time, though, fire, like frictions made by fire, right? So if the mm. shit didn't happen, I certainly feel like I wouldn't be as motivated to progress or all that. Or, that's, that's great. You know, and maybe I would be stuck in this mindset of, of cutting, you know? Yeah. And I, I, I think something that's really important to address, I'm going to try to say this every episode, is it's never too late to to start recovery. Like, it's never too late. Like, Tommy, you've been through so much stuff. Like, you I, you almost take the cake. I don't know what guest will get on here that has not gone through, like, as many crazy things as you. Uh, someone will beat him. Except Mike. Mike will always be our number one guest. Number uh, one guest, Mike. Yeah, obviously, obviously, I've suffered two heart attacks, a coma, a near death experience. I've been and look, you're life. still kicking. You're kicking ass in the gym. Like yeah. I see it every day. I see it on Instagram. I get all pissed yeah. off. Mm -hmm. And part part of that, obviously, is I've done an awful lot of work on myself. But Jason's helped me a lot recently as well, and that's been massively because I've even scaled back what I'm actually doing, and, I, and I've basically, even though I know enough what to do in the gym. I'm a personal trainer, I'm a nutritionist. I know Jason knows more than me and I've put all my trust in him and I'm taking everything back to square one and I know that when I come back out here, I'm going to build myself up even bigger and better than what I originally was. Yeah. Something. Yeah, and, and I think that's a hard part for, for any of us is putting our trust in not only somebody else to help us, which, yeah. is, which is a key, but it's putting trust back in ourselves because we don't... I do, and, and at this point, the reason I'm seeking help and the reason I work with a nutritionist and a personal trainer and all that stuff, and I, and I ask Tommy for advice, is because I do not want to fall back into the things that I would say were the right thing to do. I want to double check these things because I've made so many mistakes with myself, just trusting myself mm -hmm. or, or going, and it's not even trusting myself, I'm trusting my anorexic mindset. And that's what people need to understand is like when you're making a decision, you have to say, okay, am I making the best decision for myself? Or is this a decision that my bidysmorphic mindset is trying to make for me? And so it's like a little game that we constantly play with this fucking asshole in our head. And like, very accurate. Mine's very funny sometimes, but yeah. you're a dick. Um, a bit of a cunt. Liz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's a good topic to actually talk about if you can actually discuss this mike if you want to is yeah. obviously the, the eating disorder voice because a lot of people obviously talk about this to say what is the eating disorder voice can you actually talk about that because a lot of people relate it to something similar to schizophrenia but to me the way i put it is a schizophrenic voice is an external voice where an eating disorder voice is your internal voice yeah it's like a dis for me it's like a disassociation like, mm -hmm. like I, I'm in control and I know I, you know, I'm, I'm in control of all my mannerisms and all that, but I almost feel like there's a person controlling it sometimes. And yeah, it comes yeah, to food, like holy hell, like, like stemming back to like 10th grade when I was still in the cycle, you know, uh, Florida vacation, go out to a nice restaurant. 
this bougie ass restaurant that's not McDonald's, so you can't look up the quarter pounder, so you don't know the exact everything that you're getting. Yeah. Uh, that would fuck with me a whole lot. Yeah, that's a big thing. And I was really bad at like eyeballing things, and I'm like I can I know what every calorie is for everything now it's just like a side effect from tracking it constantly well i was i was exactly the same back then i can tell you absolutely everything but I've yeah. not, i don't i've never counted calories in a while i don't obviously measure my food anymore and i think for me that was a big part of me actually taking back control of my recovery because i knew that if i was still to do it at all I was never going to move forward. Yeah. And there's a balance too. Cause I mean, I feel like if you're tracking calories cause you want to gain weight or you're, you're trying yeah, to, that that, yeah. that's where it could come in handy where you're try, trying to track 1300 calories of, of in, in every gram of the macro. It's, it's right kind there. of, yeah, that the tracking calories mm -hmm. is definitely a double edged sword because even for right. me, even when I was still going through kind of this static state of not gaining or losing, uh, I would say that I was tracking calories because it made me accountable to gaining weight, but I still wasn't gaining weight because I knew at this calorie level, I could burn it off. So it's still like a fine line. So you, yeah. it really depends on what level you're at of, of, of recovery for yeah. the journey. And like now I don't really worry about calories as much as I worry about, for me, it's all about nutrient density and making sure I'm getting like all the right nutrients because I don't take any like vitamin stuff besides like an omega. Mm -hmm. And um, so for me, it's just making sure I'm getting nutrient dense food. And as long as I'm doing that, I kind of can let go of the calorie stuff now, which is good. Yeah. Um, but I also don't want to, so I, I, I track it to like a rough level, but like if I go over or under, I don't really, flip out on it crazy yeah Actually, I, I mostly get at mad if it goes like two under because i'm like oh i gotta eat more yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Well, generally what i what they actually see in recovery is that basically you measure your calories for one week or one month and then that's to give you a kind of ballpark idea of what you're doing and mm -hmm. then from there you just begin you basically just eyeball it for there on because you don't want to become focused on the calories itself it i gets, pretty much I pretty much eyeball it now. Yeah. It's just, it's just so tedious. Yeah, it's to gonna, be, it. gonna be a rough estimate anyway, so might as well keep it rougher. I mean, and it's, it's yeah. not rougher, but like for me, I'm like if I don't hit a particular surplus or if I think I'm on edge and maybe I'm I'm not super over in the surplus, maybe I'll try and eat more, maybe I'll just let it ride, but just don't not to be obsessed with it is is the biggest thing I feel mm -hmm. like. And you're, you're actually, like Jason's actually said to me, that your kind of diet is based upon, like, milk and obviously sandwiches, which is going to shock yeah. But yeah, man. In, in college, I'm, man, I, I don't know if it was an OCD habitual thing, but I like roast beef sandwiches. I would get them pretty much every day. And I had milk to go with that, plenty of milk. Are you and, an Arby's fan? Was that? Are you an Arby's fan? I've never been to Arby's. You've never been to Arby's? And I've never, never been to Arby's. I, you know, I actually just went to Chipotle for the first time when I got to college for my sophomore year. What was your, what was the verdict on Chipotle? Oh, it was a mouth orgasm. Like, it was a mouth <laughs> orgasm. It really, really is. You. And then, and that that it. actually <laughs> takes us on to a good point. Actually, what's your kind of opinion on like zealotry as in dietary requirements, like carnivore, vegan, everything yeah. like that? What's your kind of what's your kind of opinion on like what kind of diet we should be following, especially yeah. for people with eating disorders? Well, I feel like diets are pretty like dose dependent to the person. Um, like if let's take a like specific person. So let's take a person yeah. like like you or Ryan who've been really skinny in the past and put them on a vegan diet. Um, it either just the volume of food. You would have to eat like I don't know, and I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure there's a pretty limited number of really calorically dense foods that you could like comfortably eat on a vegan diet every day. And, Av avocado, hummus, nuts, but you know, you know yeah. the, the problem is you add in there is things like phytates, oxalates, and things like that, which mm -hmm. obviously bind to the vitamins and the fiber and things like that get into the vitamins, and you're actually losing quite a lot. Obviously, if you're taking in protein as well, 
Mm. Really, realistically, with protein, you're losing, obviously, with the thermic effect of food, you lose mm. 30% of your protein right away. And if you consider that vegan protein is even less bioavailable than your regular protein, like mm. obviously animal products, it's going to yeah. make it a lot, lot harder. Yeah, I, this, this is this is oh, so this is interesting. So this is my approach now that I think about it more is I I'm focusing on on just a, a more of like a a paleoethic type diet. So thinking mm -hmm. about like what the people of my ancestry mm -hmm. would have eaten. So like mm -hmm. a lot of whole food stuff. Like like today I'll get pizza or whatever. But that's because yeah. I'm going out. Like I don't have what well, that used to freak me out. Like going out and not having a plan freaked the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. But I try to make myself do that like weekly, anyways. Mm -hmm. But I can also get in a cycle of binge eating again. So I'm trying to like manage that. But like that's why I do it. Have you heard of the carnivore diet? I'm sure you have. Yeah, the carnivore diet. So it's funny because I know a couple people on it. So I want to know what you think of it. Yeah. Well, you know, I've I'm not super in doubt in it, but like I've seen certain youtubers that that mm. the carnivore diet like uh frankie something i think yeah I I know. <laughs> just a fucking just a lot of freaking meat frankie. You know, listen i don't i'm i'm not super well aware of, of research regarding heart disease and meat but i'm pretty sure that research is in the context of people that eat pounds and pounds and pounds and pounds of it every day um you know, I enjoy meat. I like poultry. I like meat, but uh, I try not to have a super high amount of meat because, well, my dad has prostate cancer, and he he drinks a lot of milk. And the one con about milk is is I it, it does give you a, a more of a likelihood for prostate cancer because of the IGF one. So that that is that has been kind of debunked quite a lot. There's actually there's not a great lot of data out there actually to see that that's actually the truth. Yeah, well, well, it goes back studies and things like that, and through my nutrition course, and I think honestly, it goes back to um, a little bit of your genetic profile and what you're prone mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. And like for me, I had my genetics analyzed just because I was curious, and like I may have a higher um, incidence of colon cancer if I eat a lot of processed meats. Yeah, yeah. but I don't eat processed meats anyways. So like bologna or any of that crap, I don't really eat it anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not worried about. So it kind of, it kind of, everyone's different. Like I know people that fucking chain smoke forever and like don't get cancer, and they just yeah. I mean, like it's really funky. And like Ozzy Osbourne, that dude should be dead. But like you said, there, and I do believe that that's actually the the way we should be following it is what ancestral diet because people here in Scotland, things like that is we were basically on soups, fish, meat, poultry, game, things like that. And there's quite a lot of evidence, though. Though it's there's a lot of things out there. There's a lot of arguments about it, but that you should be following what your blood type is for your diet. I'm type. I'm type O, o negative or mm. O positive. Sorry, and basically for that they say that you should follow quite a meat heavy diet. I don't, but yeah. but there is a lot of people out there that do kind of believe that. Yeah. I've got I've got to kind of look into it and see that what the actual facts are that. But whatever works for you, you know. That's, I, that's, that's exactly. Right. That's the key. I mean, honestly, I mean, I try, like, I love my milk. I get plenty of it on Z daily, but I mean, if, if I don't get it, I'll, I'll find a way to get my calories in. Mm -hmm. And, and with meat, I mean, I mean, I could just be scared about getting cancer and maybe that's why I'm a little extra precautious with that. But, uh, yeah, just you do you baby boo. Well, with happened? meat, with meat, like, generally we eat way too much meat anyways like we get generally on the american diet we get enough protein as it is we eat way over like the recommendation of protein anyways yeah it's kind of yeah. like it's uh like you either store it or you piss out the rest of the bcaa so it's kind of like you're just yeah yeah and it makes it i i would worry with the carnivore diet less about your heart necessarily yeah more about like what it does on your liver kidneys processing all that through all yeah. the time um so that's so that, that right. quite a lot of people that's done it for quite a long while. You've obviously got Sean Baker on YouTube. Oh, yeah. A great, a great channel that I think a lot of people should obviously follow is Primal Edge Health. He does like a keto carnivore approach. He's He's got great content. I thoroughly recommend ch his channel, but if anybody's kind of interested in that, but yeah. Right. 
it's really hard to judge um, diet because Probably. of how much it's changed within the last hundred years based on uh, just like companies and manufacturing, <laughs> the industrial revolution oh, stuff. You know? exactly. yeah, yeah. So it's like, it's, it's kind of like, you got to do what works for you. And when it comes to, yeah, when it comes to ideal, yes. So I feel like the best uh, diet, the most ideal diet. Um, the one that works for you. <laughs> you know, basing it off someone, you know, like you or I that, you know, wants to gain muscle, wants to improve their body, but wants to do it in a healthy, non OCD kind of habitual way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, just whatever is most comfortable for their caloric needs, the foods that they can get in to meet those needs, whether it be a surplus or a deficit, if they yeah. want to lose weight when that time comes. Yeah. Um, and especially for people that have like our anorexic mindset, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even try to get too deep. I've gotten deep into that stuff mm -hmm. and I'm deep into it now for completely different reasons other than, other than the anorexia recovery. Mm -hmm. Um, but if for someone that's really in, in the midst of recovery, uh, it's probably more dangerous to get fixated on, on the type of diet and more just on focusing on getting a lot of nutrient dense food and, and not, and just, and just eating, like just eating, like learning to just eat, you know what I mean? And not, not make it your life. Cause when eating becomes your life, that's when it becomes an obsession. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> Well, Unfortunately, when you're trying to gain muscle, eating is kind of a life. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's also very true. I suppose what I was going to ask you to obviously finish this off is what your kind of goals going forward for the future on Mike and what you can see if you're going to start your YouTube channel, what you can see obviously going on there, what you're going mm -hmm. to kind of do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I have a, a leg day, lower body day Saturday. I thought I would start off with a workout of my training just a to z so my channel will be my name mike pucci if anyone wants to find me and just you know vlogging my life just tidbits i live by a nice beach lots of young brazilians and old jewish people so maybe it could be interesting um days in the lives of eating maybe collabing with people if if they feel for some reason they want to come on my Channel. Absolutely, we'll, we'll, we'll collab with you definitely. <laughs> yeah, man, but um, just really excited to see what the future holds. But for me, right. about 165 right now. Hopefully, in the summer, I will be a lean, mean Italian machine at 175. Uh, so yeah, that's that's just that's my goals for now. Also, I got an email from UFIT. Hopefully, I get a job there. Uh, we yeah. will see. You know, yes. that, that purple is pretty sexy. But, um, yeah, I mean, your, your progress pictures were absolutely amazing. Like I see you, some of them, a lot of people were trying to say that you were on steroids and things like that because you seem to gain a lot of muscle and obviously like, very little fat, but it was nonsense, you know? Dude, like they say that steroids are as easy to get as weed, or at least Jason does <laughs> that. I mean, I've gotten my fair share of weed. I don't know where I would go to, to yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I I would say just keep doing what you're doing. You're doing absolutely great. And yeah. Progress is going and shows everything. Yeah. And guys, thank you so much for letting me come on. Yeah, of it's been an absolute pleasure. Before we go, as I think, like to tell the viewers, obviously, yeah. before we go, a message or anything like that. Um, for A message for anyone? Just... Yeah, a message for anyone that's obviously got an eating disorder that doesn't yeah. obviously not wanting help or that they're too scared to come forward. What would you say? Well, I would say to seek out help um, because it's hard to put your faith in someone else, but you, you kind of have to if, if you feel like you you just you're not in control and and to just let go of certain dogmatic ideas you may or may not have. At the least, just try to be open to new things and just baby steps with the food and the mindset uh, and, and try not to think too hard about things just let it roll you know absolutely great message it's been absolutely great speaking to you i hope Thank everybody you. can obviously like like this podcast please like share and subscribe we'll obviously put mike's channel down when he obviously starts things up and you can follow him on there thanks very much guys and remember as always binge on life pause negativity and starve guilty feelings <laughs> Ryan, it was nice to meet you.